Hello again. I'm glad you could join us as we examine the scriptures again on the matter of the role of men and women in the church. This, as I've said before, is a very troublesome subject matter for some individuals. For others, maybe not so much. However, regardless of whether you have struggled to understand this subject matter or not, it is always worth our while to examine the scriptures to make sure that we understand what the Lord is communicating to us. Remember that when it comes to the Bible, the scriptures, this is God revealing his mind to us in a written form. Out of all of the ways in which God could have communicated his truth to us, he chose writing. And the Bible talks about the fact that all scripture is inspired by the Lord. And therefore, it is profitable to us for all that we need in this life. And so we want to examine this subject matter again, and we're using 1 Corinthians. Now, this lesson that I'm sharing with you is one of 13 lessons in my latest book, Ancient Issues for Contemporary Times. The reason I put that material together was I'm fascinated by the fact that the church in Corinth, the first century world of the church in Corinth, that church is the most American church that you can read about in the New Testament. I say that because the issues that they struggled with are in many ways some of the issues that we're still struggling with here in the 21st century. Of course, the great task we have is to try to understand what was happening in that context, what culture had to do with that context, and how the Word of God was provided through the Apostle Paul in order to address godly counsel and instruction, precepts and principles, in that context. And then once we gain a better understanding of what was going on then and what was provided by way of God's teaching for that circumstance and that situation, we can work the effort of trying to apply the principles so that we can have that same godly teaching given to us to apply in our current context. Culture is very difficult when it comes to trying to understand the Word of God and apply the Word of God. And this is because we don't live in the world in which Christianity came. There are grave differences between our time and that time. And yet, the Word of God never changes. It is an eternal word for changing times. When we try to do a study like this, we are bringing in principles of hermeneutics. Uh, perhaps you've heard the term hermeneutics. It is really the science of interpretation. We're dealing with sacred hermeneutics. We're trying to ascertain what the original message was, the import was, to the original audience, and then trying to understand that and apply that in our current context. Speaking of context, there's another term that's quite important for us to consider. It is the term contextualization. Contextualization is really a trialogue of missions, of theology, and of culture or cultural anthropology. We are trying to listen to all three voices so that we can make sure we hear each voice the way we need to. We need to understand culture. We need to understand the idea of mission, bringing the message, the theology, to our current time. And so all of these things are involved in what we're trying to do, but for what we're examining right now, the role of men and women in the church, let's see what principles we can dig out from the Apostle Paul. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 and the first few verses. Our goal is not to try to understand every verse in the chapter, but we do want to gain as much as we can that addresses directly the matter of the role of men and women in the church. The Apostle Paul writes, and I'm reading from the New King James Version, the following. Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, 
that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But women, woman, is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for woman, but woman for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is a man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as women came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. Now I realize that this text has several things that give us pause, make us ask, what in the world is Paul talking about? Some statements he makes are quite clear, others are a bit abstract. Let's see if we can unpeel the onion. When we examine the, thought, the thoughts that need to really ring to us today, we have to keep in mind the key concepts, creation order and community order. It's interesting that the Apostle Paul, whenever he talks about the matter of men and women in the church or even in the home, he bases all of his teaching on what God provided in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2, when God creates Eve, he doesn't create an inferior being. He creates a being that is equal to the man. Remember, it wasn't good that the man should be alone. The man had all types of company, if you will, in the garden. In the lower creation, he had all types of life around him in the lower creation. But on par with himself, there was no one. Therefore, God created Eve, Adam's equal. This is how she can be suitable for him, or as some translations talk about, meet for him. No man was created to be above a woman by way of how God views us. No man is superior to a woman. On the other hand, no woman is superior to a man. And this is one of the amazing things we find about the Apostle Paul's teaching. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul discusses, addresses the matter of marital relationships, sex, if you will, and marriage. He talked to those, taught those Christians who were going around making the statement that it's good for a man not to touch a woman, that because of the reality of our sexual urges, we need to not stop having sex together as a married couple. This is what he was teaching them in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And so he said, because in so many words, the urge to have a sexual relationship among married people is so strong or could be so strong, then there should not be an abstinence practice except by mutual consent and even that for just a period of time and to devote life to prayer. Now, of course, in that same chapter, he talks about the fact that some men are gifted to do without sex and not be overcome by thoughts and desires for it, and the same with some women. 
The point that I want to make is that whatever he says about the man, he says about the woman. A woman whose marriage should not deprive her husband of a sexual relationship, but neither should a man who is married deprive his wife of a sexual relationship. This shows equality. Now, we have to really appreciate that Paul said that to a culture where men had the prerogative over women. And yet, the teaching he provided, which is sourced in Genesis chapter 2, is that no man has a right to demand his own way. No woman has a right to demand her own way. Here's something else that we need to keep in mind as we try to understand what Paul is getting at in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Remember, he is working from creation order. Creation order doesn't depend on culture. This is the point we made in lesson one. Christ is supracultural. The Bible is supracultural. When the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of the scriptures to write, the Spirit did not allow these individuals to be trapped in their culture, even though they were guided to apply the word of God in that culture. And so when the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 talks about how the woman should be covered, he is not saying that the women are inferior. He is talking about the fact that the covering veils, if you will, in the first century Corinthian world and culture. That covering is a sign of submissiveness. And so when he taught the women to be covered while they were engaged in praying and prophesying, he was teaching them not that they were inferior, but that despite the fact that they were given the gifts of the Spirit, the miraculous gift to pray and prophesy, which is the context of 1 Corinthians 11, praying and prophesying in worship, giving partial revelation of God by direct revelation to them in worship. While they were to do that, they were to still wear the signet, the signal of being submissive. And this is what the veils were all about. Any woman who prayed or prophesied uncovered dishonored her head. She dishonored the man because she was showing by not wearing her veil, her covering, that she was no longer under submission. Again, this does not mean that the woman is less than the man. It doesn't mean that at all. It simply means that though she is exercising this spiritual gift in the public context of worship, she still must show herself to be submissive. Why? Well, in the garden, when Eve was created and God married that first couple, the woman still had a submissive role. Don't misunderstand the scriptures. Submission between men and women, the relationship of the man being the head of the woman, that's not the result of the fall. No, my friends, this was before the fall. And we only tend to have difficulty with that when we think of submission as a negative thing. But remember what we read in 1 Corinthians 11. The head of Christ is God. Now, that doesn't make Jesus any less God. He is God in the flesh, equal with the Father. Said in another way, when Jesus walked this earth, he was being submissive to the Father. He obeyed the Father in everything. And yet, John teaches us in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the first chapter of the letter of Hebrews, we read about how Jesus is the exact essence of God. You see, 
Jesus, even while in the flesh, never stopped being God. He's always equal with his Father. And yet, he took on a submissive role. When it comes to men and women, no man is above a woman. No woman is above a man. They are equal. And yet, the woman is called upon to live a submissive role. Now, here's something else to consider, and I realize that we have to pull in various scriptures as we're looking at 1 Corinthians 11, and that's by design. But we need to understand the teaching on this matter in several texts of scripture so that we can come to a good, solid conclusion on what the Bible's teaching is on the matter. In Galatians chapter number 3, verse 26 to 28, Paul says that we are all one in Christ Jesus. And yet he would turn around and write in Ephesians chapter 5 that the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So there is a need for us to recognize that men and women are equal. And yet they have different roles. Yes, we're one in Christ. Men don't get better salvation than women. We are equal in the sight of God, and yet we are given different roles. Perhaps we need to take another second and think about what submission means and what it doesn't mean. Again, it certainly doesn't mean that the one doing the submitting is of lesser import or value than the one to whom they are submitting. When we think about a text such as Ephesians chapter 5, and beginning at verse number 21, the Apostle Paul wrote, submitting to one another. That concept is very important to understand. In Ephesians 5 and verse 21, the idea of mutual submission means that no particular Christian has the right to exercise, to demand his or her own prerogative. In the context of the church, no one Christian has the right to demand his or her prerogative. In the context of the Christian home, no man or woman has the right to demand his or her own prerogative. In the context of parents and children, no parent has the right to demand his or her own prerogative over the child. And certainly the reverse is true. When it comes to every Christian relationship, no one has the right to demand his or her own prerogative. Demanding one's own prerogative has the thought of, I want it this way. It shall be this way because this is what I want. The only one who has the right to do that is the God who created us. He and he alone can demand his own prerogative. And yet, isn't it amazing? When he commands us, he does so out of love. It's never a selfish demand. He reveals that nature in Christ. Jesus, though being God in the flesh, never never made use of his God nature as a means of demanding his own prerogative. No, his will was to do the will of the one that sent him. Now, what does all of this have to do with 1 Corinthians 11? When the women were told to pray and prophesy, being covered, it teaches us that though they were given in that particular setting, remember this is a non-normative case, Whenever they were given the miraculous power to engage in that miraculous, those miraculous gifts of the Spirit, they were still to do so, showing submission. The veil, the covering, indicated submission. The veil, the covering, also indicated modesty, purity. Now, there's one other thing that we need to examine before we end our lesson for this time. That is that women in Corinth who were given this miraculous ability in the public worship setting 
would also engage in the idea of questioning their husbands. There could be circumstances in first century Corinth where, let's say, the wife of one of the men was given the miraculous spiritual gift and exercised it during the worship. And he too exercised the same gift during the worship. Well, one of the things that took place was the others who would hear would judge the clarity, perhaps better said, the authenticity of what was being said by someone else. Remember, they had no Bible, so to speak, as like we have today. No one could listen to brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so and then say, let's sit down and examine that. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter so-and-so. No, my friends, the Bible was in the making. And so they were dealing with partial revelation. And they did have Old Testament scripture. And so there would be the need to, shall I say, verify the veracity of what was being said. Well, in some cases, perhaps one of the sisters, a wife, would sit and try to examine her husband, whether or not what he said is actually according to what knowledge could be known at that time from the scriptures of the Old Testament. Well, that too would show a violation of that time and culture, the relationship of husband and wife. Oh, but that's not the point. The real point goes back to Genesis. That would again show that the submissive role is not being played by the woman. Not because she's lesser, but because that's the role she was given. There's much more for us to examine as we think about this subject matter. And I'm sure by listening to this video, you may have several questions. I want to welcome you to share your questions with me. You can respond to the video by presenting a question or you can simply uh, send an email by way of the information in the uh, video information for this particular video. And I would be happy to hear your questions and to try to give you a clear answer, a clear response to your question. Remember, we are about trying to understand the Word of God more clearly so that we can follow our Lord more nearly, more dearly love Him. I hope and trust that this instruction has been helpful to you. Perhaps for no other reason than it's sparked some questions in your mind. Made you think a little more deeply about the subject matter. I encourage you to join us next time as we go a little further in understanding the role of men and women in the church. Until that time, may the Lord bless you in the special ways in which you need most.